Hi everybody, I'm Ellen Fisher and we're here at the Center for Spiritual Care for an art exhibit called Collaboration, which is a collaboration between Sean Sexton and Sharon Sexton, husband and wife uh, artists. I would call them a team, but they don't work together on their paintings. They follow uh, the same path, but each with their own canvas or lump of clay. So let's say hello to Sean Sexton. Hello, Sean. Hello, Ellen. And you are a native of Vero Beach. Of Vero Beach. And you live on Treasure Hammock Ranch. That's which right. Your That's grandfather right. from Purdue University, a nice Purdue University grad, established in the 1920s. Um, you're going to have to tell me that. You're, <laughs> you're the Hoosier. I'm the Hoosier. Well, I'm not really. Or the I'm, Midwesterner. Yeah, Midwesterner. I'm from Chicagoland, but I did spend a lot of time in the Hoosier state. And my other grandparents, um, you know, uh, Don Harold, a classic cartoonist. With, right, exactly. The Indiana University. University Libraries has his and, work. Yeah, and that's Indiana where they met. University. That's where the two grandfathers met. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's how things got uh, started. So a good Midwesterner came down here, and of course, what did he do? He started a, a farm, a ranch, as well as many other things. He started... A thousand things. A thousand. He was an entrepreneur. And he platted part of Vero Beach? Well, he certainly uh, settled, bought mm -hmm. and settled. Um, uh, early on, uh, he bought a 40-acre block, and then he bought another 40-acre block, and then uh, he was going to buy another one. And uh, the fellow uh, who in whose charge all of this was said, you've bought enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> He came with 500 bucks in his pocket, mm -hmm. and so uh, he had something to work with. That he was a lot. He did. That was a lot of money back then, yeah. especially in Florida, which was uh, undeveloped, unlike we see today, where... Especially this part. You know, exactly. This, this wonderful resort area, as it has become. It was uh, really dense, you know, the, yeah. f the foliage, and uh, it was a Florida music hammock, really, the whole... The whole East Coast. Yeah. And, uh, and you grew up on the Treasure Hammock Ranch. And we should mention that your grandfather's name was Waldo Sexton. That's right. And if you want to see his spitting living image, we just have to look to Sean. You, you resemble your grandfather greatly. Do you think so? I, I mean, it, it's I hard know, for me Especially to... when I see you in photographs, you uh -huh. know, walking through McKee Garden or something, I say, there, there's Waldo. But wow. you, you grew up on Waldo's Ranch, and you actually went uh, to the University of Florida in Gainesville That's for right. animal husbandry, but you started painting informally there and dropping in on art critiques in the art department. And you know, I actually I, uh, I started painting when I was eight years old mm -hmm. in this neighborhood, basically, oh, really? um, with Dorothy Curzon. And she wound up teaching art at uh, St. Ed's okay. later on. But um, the uh, turpentine, I think you still use turpentine, don't you? No, I've, I've switched to odorless mineral spirits. It, it gave me a headache. I yeah. was eight years old. And, uh, uh oh. And I, uh, I left her place with a headache every, every, you know, every week. Yeah. And um, she was. Uh, she was kind of a, you know, she painted uh, florals and still lifes mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think, you know, and I don't want to give a bad impression of her, but uh, she sort of answered to the parents and uh, mm. she would help your painting along if, if you weren't doing so well with it. And uh, I was uh, suited to using crayons. Mm -hmm. And I made big things with crayons, and mm -hmm. it's very uh, no nobody did things in that scale, and and I was a much better uh, crayon than I could have ever been turned into a painter by her. Yes, and and you started drawing at a very young age, and of course there aren't any of your notebooks here on display. You've had them on display in other art exhibitions. But you keep a running diary, a journal of drawings and your thoughts jotted down, and you have... Started in 73. Volumes and, and volumes. And so the, the latest one should be under my arm right now, but <laughs> when I got out of the car, I realized I didn't have it with me. I feel naked. But yeah. uh, there are about 150 volumes now. 
It's pretty wonderful. And also, you're, a, you're an author of, of not only books about your family's history here, but a poet as well. That's right, yeah. Um, I have three published uh, full poetry volumes and two chapbooks. And uh, so I uh, have been doing that a lot. And uh, that's all part of my process. Yes. And so here's how it works. Um, and also, I do clay, you know. And, yes, indeed. And Sharon has been a big influence on me in that regard. And yes. also a mentor. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that Sharon isn't here today. Oh, me too. You're yeah. going to have to fill in. You're going to have to be Sharon a little bit. I'm but let's, work let's go out. right to the art. Because first okay. I want to talk about the elephant in the room. And that is Song of the South. Oh, which okay. is over on, on the main wall when you, you come in the door, you lay your eyes on it. And speaking of your early experience with still life, I don't think Mrs. Curzon would have approved of some of your later subject matter. Oh, I think she, she would have. Uh, her, her daughter was, was, was a painter, too, and mm -hmm. she's seen my work. And uh, yeah, I think, I think Mrs. Curzon was pleased. She, oh, okay. she was in on, uh, she saw things that I did, you know, throughout time. And, uh, but uh, I, I started that painting after I saw Ken Burns' um, Civil War series. Oh my, why, why so? Why did you do that? Because um, at the time I was doing uh, still lifes in my studio and um, there's another still life in the show that, um, that we might refer to, uh, the Melon and Beefheart painting. Yes. But they are, um, I, was, I was looking at, uh, there had been an Antonio Lopez Garcia show mm -hmm. at, at the, it was at the Marlboro, it was his debut mm -hmm. in New York, and Robert Hughes wrote a wonderful review of it and mm -hmm. declared him the greatest living painter. And uh, he was 65 years old right at that moment. And that was yes. 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, he had, uh, been influenced and, and Hughes referenced um, Goya's Bodegon paintings, mm -hmm. which are kitchen still lifes. It's another genre of, uh, of still yes. life, and um, aside from Dutch vanitas. And, mm -hmm. But um, I did about, uh, Goya did 12 mm -hmm. during the famine of uh, Madrid, mm -hmm. and uh, I started doing them and the melon and beef heart was one of the paintings that I did and I did it on the table in the uh, in the studio in, the, in yeah. The, yeah in the studio uh, uh, and I had done probably I don't know probably six or seven mm -hmm. still lives and one day it just struck me uh, I should paint this setting and not just the table and the, exactly. and the things on the table. The environment should, as well. Yeah, and uh, I actually, I was working, I was, I'm a fool, you know, I was working on heavy watercolor paper, gessoed, mm -hmm. and uh, all those others are on that, that um, so this substrate. So this is paper, this is watercolor paper. paper. Okay. And so uh, I decided in the very still life I was painting, um, I decided um, needed to grow, and mm -hmm. I I added paper there. I think there are probably six editions. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. You oh, know, so it just kept. It kept growing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and until it arrived it, at this size, which is about forty-eight inches tall and six feet wide, right? Yeah, it's actually it's a closer to five. Five feet. Five. Yeah. Oh, okay. But. Um, the uh, the Civil War thing, uh, the idea went along with the uh, uh, the growth of the painting and the subject matter and the uh, background mm -hmm. of war, and uh, the things under the table are the past. Yes, the bones. And uh, I realized that I uh, that I needed to uh, cover the things on the on the top were now. Mm -hmm. And that I needed to cover that idea that what we see now and where we are now is so greatly influenced by what we don't see. Okay. And the, the relationship of the things under the table and on top 
have that same connection. A little bit like Goya's uh, still life paintings done during famine. We don't see the famine, but he was painting food. He was, yeah. And uh, you don't paint famine here. You paint, you paint bounty as well as the past there was an, and the a, present. A, Somebody said to me, there, there's an internal component in your still lifes that mm -hmm. uh, still lifes don't ordinar ordinarily have. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he, he compared them to Goya as well. You know, the, the turkey, the, the plucked turkey mm -hmm. looks like the crucified uh, Lord mm -hmm. laid across that diagonal in the, uh, in the rectangle. Yes, and that's a very old idea too that still life painters have. Uh, used vegetables and uh, other other objects to stand in for uh, more more common uh, greater themes. People like ask me what, what, and battles what, and things. Why that? Why that's human skull? You know, and uh, it's because I, I, it well. <laughs> I didn't care to. Uh, you do know well. I do. <laughs> I I didn't care to paint a human being in the painting, mm -hmm. but I wanted to evoke uh, humanity, and uh, mm -hmm. and so that's why. And it's not so unusual a thing in art, you know, it, it certainly... Certainly not in the Vanitas, which is what this painting that, is. That's yeah. right, yeah. Which is a, a vanity, a painting about vanity, always yeah. vanity. Don't, don't uh, prepare for tomorrow because you don't know, you might drop It's Ecclesiastes, vanity. isn't it? Exactly, yeah, yeah. In the Bible. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And a very famous subject for both Dutch and Spanish and us modern paintings, painters too. Well, let's look very quickly at that beef heart and okay. squash. And um, that's the oldest painting in this exhibition, I think. I think you're right, yeah. You know, uh, this one that we just talked about was 1995, and this one must be early 2000s anyway. Yeah, actually that one's uh, 90. It's, uh, oh, okay. This one's 86 or 85. Oh, okay, so it is, yeah. yeah. But um, I think you're correct, it's, it's the oldest one. Mm -hmm. and, it was uh, painted to, um, to speak of my life balancing, uh, I, I can just say the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom mm -hmm. on the land. And I wanted to get representatives of... Um, Equivalents. Yeah, that, that yeah. were of the same approximate weight. And, yes. And uh, even texture in a certain way. And uh, so... Uh, I was struck with that. Uh, that actually came straight out of uh, seeing the the uh, uh, reproduction in Time magazine of uh, Antonio Lopez Garcia's flayed rabbit mm, or okay. skinned rabbit. Right. And uh, it's also mm -hmm. kind of a that is is some something of a fetal uh, uh, yes. evo evocation. Right. And um, the. Uh, there's just a, a gravity um, of that element or, or subject, I guess is a better word, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, enabled me to see and paint the melon and beef heart. Yes, well it's certainly stripped down. It's, it's life and death. It's uh, the Egyptians thought your soul was in your heart, I believe, not in your brain or <laughs> somewhere else or in your stomach or something. So it it, it, and, and it's also, the, the melon is very womb-like, you know, so you have yeah. a lot of life, death, and the, the cycle, which is, the cycle of life is what your paintings are all about. That was it, and that balance, you know, uh, uh, we, we can't open a gate to another place mm -hmm. uh, on our land, mm -hmm. and I have to make everything work within that confine, and you could say the, yeah. the rectangle. Is and, that confine. The, yeah, the, the and, ground plane yeah. could be the, the landscape. It's the color of blood. But Indeed, and both of those are chambers as well. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, there's a lot of, I, I love this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Symbolism, well let's talk about something a little less heavy, and that would be a still life by Sharon Sexton. And that is the ranch still life, which also deals with the uh, ranch but maybe in a more romantic way, do you think? Well, I think um, romantic. That's an interesting uh, well, thought. Well, the moon is in the sky. Yeah. There's the, a gorgeous bird. I think that um, she's, a, she's a very intuitive painter. Mm -hmm. And, I th you know, um, it's really just sort of a consummation of her 
of her vision and her imagination. And um, in other words, you're, you're suggesting maybe she romanticized the the landscape. I think and, she does. And the I setting. mean, you cut you cut a... you cut the melon open in a different way than she <laughs> yeah. does. You know, you expose all, and um, she exposes a gentler and I, I don't know what else to say, but romantic. It's softer. It's everything is shrouded in a mist, um, sort of a misty-eyed love. I I could go along with that. I think yeah. there's. An imaginary aspect of romanticism, of course, yes, and yes. Uh, and so um, I think that she, you know she probably uh, did that whole painting from her imagination. Yes, everything that I did was set up in a studio from life. Exactly, or when you do your landscapes, you're out there for as long as it takes. Yeah. The thing I like about her painting also is the, the fruits do, I mean, they're very fecund, her still lifes, with lots of fruits and the watermelon broken open to see the seeds. It's all about uh, maternity, I think, she, a lot in she, her work. She may well have set up those pieces of fruit and painted them mm -hmm. directly. But certainly that's, but, that's the back 40 behind them. Yeah, that's, she that's, filled in the, the, uh, the bird and the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, she uh, she most certainly did. And, uh, yeah, does she think she does the the objects first and then paints the landscape behind them? I think it all happens at the same time. All simultaneously. Yeah. Well, how about in the one that that is called My Diego? Now, this is another one that. Oh yeah, yeah. There's uh, something very Frida Kahlo like, both about the one we just spoke about with the still life, the Frida Kahlo like still life of the tropical fruits. And then my Diego is a, a, a direct reference to she, Frida. Sharon read Hayden Herrera's biography of, of Frida. Mm -hmm. We've seen, uh, we, we not only saw the, uh, the Julie Brown, Julie Brown? Uh, Tina Brown. Oh, okay. Uh, no, that's not right. No, either. Julie Tina Brown Tamor, is the Daily Beast. <laughs> Julie, Julie Taymor um, oh, okay. production of Frida. Mm -hmm. You know the rec the most recent one with Salma Hayek in it, and yes, and so we have been thinking about Frida a lot, and mm -hmm. we went to the uh, Gelman collection and first in Fort Lauderdale and then at the Norton mm -hmm. and saw her paintings, and uh, we've just been we both are crazy about both of them. And well, there's something like Frida in this too because Sharon is painting herself as an Earth goddess. And who in the world is her Diego? Why did she name it that, <laughs> Siobhan? Yeah. When, you who know, is that little figure holding a palette wearing cowboy boots? remember Frida put uh, a Diego uh, right in the middle of her figure right in the middle of her Diego third on eye. my mind, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, no, it's, it's, her, um, it's her world. Um, it's, it's a, uh, I'm thinking in, in poetry, you, you would say maybe lift a line out of a poem, uh, and uh, add it into your thought, and it's. I think that she uh, she borrowed from uh, the spirit of Frida. I gave her uh, the Frida's journals, that wonderful volume that has her writing and mm -hmm. illustrations in it. Uh, and so she she's just everything about Frida in in that sense. But um, she also is crazy about Walter Anderson. And, uh, so are you. Yeah, so, I'm, <laughs> so am I. <laughs> and uh, there are other, of course, you know, influences, but um, Emile Gallet, for instance. Yes. But, um, uh -huh. It all pertains really to what we've seen and uh, relished together. Yeah, you know, what I'm hearing is you're surrounded by the natural beauty of the, the ranch. And, yeah. um, but you also are very active gallery, museum goers readers, film watchers, and this is all blended together in the big blender called Treasure Hammock Ranch. Yeah, we're, we're consumers of uh, inspiration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a, a way of putting that. And the things um, that are sort of on the periphery of our lives that work their way into the middle of our lives uh, Which comes through inspiration. Which comes out canvas, yeah. Um, or, you know, they, they translate into our art. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always been that way in, in great art, you know, or 
I'm, oh yes. Yeah. yeah. You well, write I, what you know. You paint what you know. If yeah. You're an artist. And um, and seek to know what you uh, what, what you know what feeds you. Exactly. There's a lot of thought that goes into exactly why you're there and what you're doing. I imagine when you're so closely tied to your surroundings. I was wondering about the little tiny, tiny picture of you in there. Is that the only picture of you that Sharon has ever painted? Well, um, she modeled a picture of me in that, uh, that cover piece that we have on the card. Mm -hmm. That's another, uh, um, the, I called it, um, what did I call it? Uh, uh, mat matrimonial with animals. Yes. And, uh, but that really is another, uh, well, that is you and you and she and, both. So let's take a look at matrimony and animals right now. Yeah, it's an effigy. Of, it's a mixed media effigy. Yeah. Uh, Sharon and Sean is Adam and Eve <laughs> <laughs> in he, the Garden of Eden, which is Treasure Hammock Ranch. And and really, uh, Diego and Frida are, are somewhat at play. Uh, in, yes, yes. In, in her imagination, I guess I have that same kind of scale to her that Diego had to Frida. Yes. And, what did they call him? The the not the elephant. Did they call him oh, that? She called him a frog. She said that he had yes. the face of a frog. But he, he was just a very large man, as are you, tall yeah. and a big presence. They were called the giants of Sequeiros Orozco oh, yes. and uh, Diego, the the, mm -hmm. the this, muralist. Uh, but I think the, the term Grandes. originally came out of Diego, just his pure scale as a human being. Yes, and the huge. size of the murals that he would do. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, all of them the, they were going after. And that's the thing about Sharon. She is unintimidated uh, by large walls. She'll mm -hmm. go and paint a woman's uh, mm -hmm. living room, you know, or, or dining room. And, and she's also done public. Uh, yes. Public uh, mosaic works and things like that that people can see around town. Yeah, the uh, the pillars at Royal Palm Point. Yes, but she always has point. this again a fantasy sort of. I don't want to cut it because there's a certain gravity to her work that you speak of in your work, but there's also a, a playfulness that it's, that that you are always very serious, you know. But she has a. Look at look at these these funny people. Adam and Eve reimagined is in in this particular one that we've She's been talking She's an imaginative about. artist, and uh, with the owl and all the little animals, and of course the figures are nude. Yeah. Something very <laughs> elemental, just like in your work. Yeah, the uh, they had to be nude because the clay was nude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's sort of yeah, sort of in its natural state. That's yeah, right. Un yeah. Unglazed and there as of course I'm not nude in the yeah. in the my Diego painting, but no, you do have the boots and the she hat. She ha has and your me palette. in my working men's garb, you know. Well, let's talk about your own self-portrait just to end up then. Oh, okay. In your studio, sure. where you're, would you call that semi-nude? <laughs> we don't know what's. It's a torso length, I think. Yeah. You're wearing an apron, okay? So. Yeah, I have a, a printmaker's. Uh, Apron, apron and on it's and it's hot in your studio and there is a fan there. I mean it gets a little bit of the idea of Florida in the summertime, I think, here. Yeah, and uh, and the amazing thing is I'm I'm so much younger in the, <laughs> in the painting and uh, that happens. You, uh, there's only one way to stay one age, you know. Yeah. The picture <laughs> and, of Dorian uh, Gray. Right? I haven't been able to <laughs> figure out an a, an alternative. To it's aging. good. I love, the, I love that one with the key hanging up and the angel singing. So art is happening and the angel is singing. The, the, yeah, the heavens are rejoicing because you're in the uh, studio. I was probably singing in the choir at the community church. At that time? At that time, or at least greatly. I'm sure I was because I was, um, that brought that on, you know, that painting that, it was a postcard on the, literally on the, the uh, bulletin board behind me. It's yeah. a little bit a, a, a painting of the senses, another throwback to the Renaissance and before. Yes. You have yeah. a sight, you have the breeze blowing from the fan, you have a, a reference to music or sound. And the wire, you see the wire with the handle? Yeah. On the, on the picture, um, that's actually, it's called giggly wire. And it's uh, obstetrical wire and 
it, it's uh, been used, that, that very wire, and I put it there, you know, as a symbol mm -hmm. of, um, to actually saw a calf up in utero to get him out. Oh, if piece. it's a stillborn he, calf? Yeah, maybe he was too big to get out uh, whole. And uh, it's a, oh, it's such a difficult thing. So it refers to some, again, to the nitty gritty of life and death on the ranch. It does, yeah. You mortality. know, I could talk to you for two more days about this. I remember you telling me about a breech birth that you performed when you were supposed yeah. to be somewhere else one time, and it was very colorful, but we don't have time for that now. So <laughs> I'm going to thank you for coming in and talking about both your and Sharon's work. Well, and congratulations on this show. It's really wonderful. I think so, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a, I, I put on my card 42 years in the making, mm -hmm. and um, that's how long we've been, we've been together. Is this your first show together? No, it's not. No. But we've, it's, we've, yeah. had, uh, we've had several, really. Yeah. But um, this is our best show together, I think. I think so too. And I'll tell you why. I think this space, we were talking about the living room aesthetic mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, uh, it's, an, it's unusual to art spaces. But um, we imported our living room into this room oh. in a certain way. And if not completely our living room, there were a couple other living rooms too. Indeed, involved. Yeah. Uh, we had to borrow most of Sharon's work in this show mm -hmm. because she, her work has just been uh, bought and out in the world. Well, it's, it's a very intimate show. It's an intimate relationship and I hope people will come and see it. Thanks again for coming to visit me and Sean Sexton here at the Center for Spiritual Care. Bye everybody. Ha, ha, ha.